Good afternoon and welcome back to our next session, supporting our seafaring community through increased cultural competence and wellness promotion. My name is Becca Bolas and I'll be moderating today's session. A couple of reminders before I introduce our speakers. The first is that we are offering conference captioning services. Within each session, you will automatically be provided with captioning, which will appear beneath the video stream. You can click the link to access it in a separate window if you prefer, and if you don't need the service, you can push the pause stop button to stop the stream. The second reminder is to please be sure to complete the session evaluation. It's very short, just four questions, and your feedback is very helpful to us. It is required to complete the evaluation if you're seeking continuing education credits. You can find the evaluation in the session description, and I'll also drop it in the chat momentarily. I'm now excited to introduce our session speakers, Jenna Godot from Midcoast Health and Monique Coombs from Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Thanks for joining us again. My name is Jenna Goto. I'm the Prevention Manager at Southern Midcoast Communities for Prevention in Brunswick. And my co-presenter today is Monique Coombs, Director of Community Programs at Maine Coast Fishermen's Association. Today, we'll highlight our process and share how community collaboration with non-traditional partners leads to opportunities, discuss the importance of finding new partners to help identi identify and support the unique industry needs and culture of a fishing community as a way of supporting fishermen well mental wellness. We'll also discuss how systems, policies, and the environment impact health outcomes of our fishermen. We have no disclosures regarding um, commercial relationships. So our learning objectives today to identify strategies for working with non-traditional partners, um, identify system, the way systems impact health outcomes of the seafaring community, and to discuss why cultural competence is essential for supporting fishermen wellness. So the history and partnership, as a member of the public health and prevention community, it's easy to find natural partners that work in the field of grant funding and community assessments, health data, or even traditional partners like our schools and other health organizations, or even medical providers. But the reality is, if we look outside of the box of those known entities, we create new opportunities and progress towards increasing overall health and wellness of people and families within our communities. Our coalition serves Sagadahoc County, Brunswick, and Harpswell. You can see a large piece of our service area is coastal on this map, making the seafaring community a big part of who we are, and this highlights why this partnership was so important. In 2019, we were officially um, kind of seeking a way to better focus and work with the fishing communities. We know that often outside groups um, or people aren't as well received as someone from within. So we connected with um, Monique and the Brunswick-based organization to work as a community liaison for us or a partner within the commercial, commercial fishing industry. So having other experiences in, you know, in other work where, with community liaisons, we knew this was an important connection to make. At the inception of our relationship, we realized that we actually had a common goal, and that common goal was fisherman wellness. We're going to show a video here, a little bit, a uh, short video about MCFA and their work to support um, their fishermen and well, over and their fisherman wellness. The Maine Coast Fishermen's Association supports generations of fishing families that are an integral part of Maine's iconic working waterfront. From the start of their day to the end of ours, we as a community are supporting one another. Rule number one in the past was you always got the weather before you made decisions whether you was going to go fishing. It's definitely a lot more complex, a lot more complicated than it was back when I started. At MCFA, we work together with fishermen and fishing communities to celebrate our fishing heritage while building a sustainable and vibrant future for fishing families in Maine. I probably wouldn't be here talking right now if it wasn't for Maine Coast Fishermen's Association because they're our voice at the end of the day. They're helping us more ways than one. We support fishermen by ensuring they have access to the working waterfront and fishing grounds, by investing in research and innovation, and by giving them a voice to fight for our marine resources and the needs of the fishing communities. With fishermen-led initiatives like electronic monitoring, we're helping fishermen collect better data for science while simplifying the process for getting out on the water safely. 
These days, for me to get ice, I need to order it two days ahead of time. MCFA, they've been a big help as far as getting ice right now. Observer coverage, I have EMs and cameras, and they've been a big help on that. Whether they're on the water or safe in port, MCFA provides fishermen with the support systems they need to succeed. Our Fishermen's Wellness Program has life rafts and safety gear that they can borrow at multiple locations along the coast. I know here in this community, most everybody knows each other and they look out for each other. They look out for each other's families. If somebody's in trouble, they're there to help them. And that's the same way out on the water. Our community is strongest when we work together, and MCFA is working with fishermen, working waterfront businesses, and community partners to help support those who are struggling with food insecurity. In 2020, MCFA launched our Fisherman Feeding Mainers program that provided over 200,000 seafood meals to children and families while creating opportunities for fishermen to stay on the water. You take the fishing aspect from this community, I think personally you lose a lot of your tourism. It's part of the community now, always has been. We do love having you here, you know, you help us. <laughs> the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association supports a thriving community of fishermen across generations, fisheries, gear types, and communities throughout the state of Maine and beyond. Join our effort to ensure we have sustainable fisheries and vibrant fishing communities for this and future generations of fishermen so that we can all continue and enjoy local seafood and the way life should be here in Maine. So that was a great summary about MCFA. So going back to the beginning and the inception of our work, we realized that before we could actually address mental health or substances, we needed to do more to understand the overall needs of this group, um, what existed or was already in place to support them and to really understand the people working in this industry. So now we'll move into systems, policies, and the environment, and the role these topics play in the lives of our fishermen. Monique will share some examples and discuss the impact on health outcomes. Thanks, Jenna, and thanks so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. It's always exciting to talk about MCFA and commercial fishing uh, with a new group of people. So as Jenna mentioned, um, our office is located in Brunswick, but we do work with fishermen all along the coast of Maine and even some in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. And as the video mentioned, we work with fishermen in all fisheries. So lobster, uh, scallops, groundfish, which is species like pollock, um, haddock, halibut, monkfish, um, and in all sorts of fisheries, uh, different types of gear. So I think a good place to start is just to also define what I'm talking about when I say commercial fishing, which um, in the United States, we have very well-managed sustainable fisheries. And when I talk about commercial fishing, I'm talking about like the fisherman in this picture and his opportunity to be able to go out on the ocean to catch fish and land it for, uh, for money, which is what I'm talking about. Um, Commercial fishing sometimes can have some negative connotations. People conjure huge nets that are sweeping up everything in its way. But in the United States, as I mentioned, the fisheries are sustainable, but they're often um, small businesses and family businesses like my own family. Um, not only do I work for Maine Coast Fishermen's Association, but I am a, a fisherman's wife. Um, and just specifically too, so the lobster industry in the state of Maine is owner operator, which means the guy behind the wheel. So that guy is Jerry. He fishes out of Port Clyde. He owns the boat and as, as well as the permit. And he has to be on the boat to be able to fish for a lobster. So that, that's an owner operator fishery. Commercial fishing can be pretty complicated, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. It's um, managed by the National Marine Fishery Service, which is part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, informally called NOAA Fisheries. Um, unlike our colleagues in the USDA, the uh, United States Department of Agriculture, the USDA is, uh, they regulate agriculture, but they also advocate for farmers, whereas the National Marine Fisheries Service is really charged with managing marine resources. That's wonderful, but we don't have the same advocacy for fishermen themselves at the federal level, which is why organizations like the Maine Coast Fishermen's Association and our, our friends and colleagues at the Maine Lobstermen's Association is so important is because we're advocating for the fishermen themselves as human beings. 
It's also why partnerships like this one with the Southern Maine Community Prevention that Jenna works for, um, it allows us to sort of fill in some of those knowledge gaps and really try to make a human connection in regards to whatever it is that we're talking about or whatever problems that exist. Um, do you want to skip forward, Jenna? Some of the other systems, um, as we're talking about, that exist that can impact fishermen are things like working waterfront and climate change. So again, just to define the language that I'm using when I talk about working waterfront, I'm talking about working waterfront for commercial activities specifically. So um, wharfs like the one that are pictured, this is in Harpswell, um, which is actually where I live. Wharfs for commercial fishing can be pretty big, um, like some of the ones that exist in Stonington. Um, they have lots of different skiffs, they have conveyor belts, they have updated technology, all the way to wharfs like this one that are just used by a handful of fishermen to store gear um, and to be able to access the water. Climate change, as you can imagine, um, impacts fishermen greatly, things like sea level rise, warming waters, um, species shifting patterns, things like that. But one of the things that that type of thing um, can do to impact commercial fishing is while well, climate change impacts them, so do some of the things that um, we do to adapt and mitigate for climate change. And so it's really important that they are included in the process and system because these things can, can impact them more quickly um, and impact their businesses more quickly than climate change can. So just for example, and this is a pretty simple one, when a town decides to institute a no idling ordinance, that's a great ordinance, but for lobster fishermen that require, you know, reefer trucks and things like that, there, there needs to be some ability to, to, to idle, basically. And so it's important to include fishermen in that process just to really understand how something that's changing can impact their business um, and thinks we can find solutions if they're included in that process. The other thing that's important about working waterfront um, and climate change is there's a term called solastalgia, which is a feeling of homesickness when you're already at home. This is pretty common, I think, on the coast of Maine right now as fishermen are watching their communities change. I think we have all seen Maine change a little bit after COVID. So if a working waterfront loss is due to climate change reasons or access is lost because of um, new property owners that don't allow a clamor access to the water via traditional routes, that doesn't just impact a fisherman's business. Um, it also impacts um, his or her mental health uh, uh, quite a bit as well. Next slide. So obviously regulations and policy change are things that can um, dramatically impact a, a fisherman. Going back to the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is um, where fishing is regulated, there it's so complicated. So National Marine Fisheries Service is driven by something called the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries and Conservation Act. It's sort of their guiding principle. But there's also numerous management bodies and numerous advisory councils. And for each one of those fisheries that I spoke about, whether it's ground fish, lobster, or scallops, or once upon a time we had when we had a shrimp fishery, each of those fisheries has their own set of regulations, um, their own advisory council, um, their own permitting process, their own costs, and their own different reporting. So if a fisherman participates in three different fisheries, that's basically like having three different small businesses to sort of manage under a larger umbrella. And that can be quite a stressor for them, um, especially as rules and regulations and reporting changes, which there are changes that are happening quite often in the commercial fishing industry. And that has the potential to, to really impact um, their health and wellness. Um, and, and that note too, the other thing that's important to note about commercial fishing is fishermen do not set the price for the product that they're landing. Um, so anytime there's a change in their business and an increase in cost, it's not like some other small businesses where they can just increase the cost of whatever product they're selling. They have to figure out how to manage their time and business according to whatever they're given for their catch at the dock. So when fuel prices go up, when the price of bait goes up, that all sort of adds increasing stress um, onto what they're already doing. 
and understanding some of these types of things and, and recognizing how complicated it is, is really important in some of these partnerships, just to be able to really work well with the audience with whom you're working, which of course, in this case is commercial fishermen. And now I'm gonna give it back to Jenna for a moment in the next slide. So thanks, Monique. Um, so why is cultural competence relevant here? Oftentimes we hold a different frame of reference from people we engage with on certain topics. So understanding more about the person we're talking to helps with the connection, which we know is so important. An example here may be understanding something as big as environmental factors, or in the end, maybe it's something as simple as language. So if a cl clinician has a basic understanding of not only the complexity of their fisherman's work, but even an understanding of general vocabulary, it offers a better chance to let their work be um, about helping their patient and not trying to understand what they're talking about. So I'm going to hand it back over to Monique to go cover, um, share a little bit, talk a little bit more about culture and cover a little bit of this local vernacular. So uh, fishing is so integrally tied to a fisherman's identity. It's not just a livelihood or a job for them. It really is just their way of life and part of their culture. Um, you can hear that in the language. If you ask them like just what they're thinking about when they're talking with each other, they're always talking about their, their boats or their business. And so as Jenna mentioned, having an understanding of that language helps to communicate with them, not just about what's going on, but even to sort of get a gauge on how they're doing as a human. So one of the things um, that I've mentioned in working with Jenna and others in the past is, Fishermen will speak about their wellness sort of by proxy through their business or their boat. So if you ask them, hey, how's your boat doing? Um, how they answer that question might give you an idea of how they're doing. Um, if a fisherman says they're tearing apart their boat, and I think that's the third one down, tear up the boat, that usually means that they sort of are trying to find something to work on or something broke and they're working on it. And you can just sort of get an idea of how they're feeling by how much work that they're doing or whether they're excited about it or not. And some of the language here too, just can also give you hints into how dangerous fishing can be sometimes, which I, I should have touched on. Uh, it is a risky, risky occupation. Um, for a number of years, the Northeast groundfish fishing uh, fishery was the most dangerous civilian occupation in the United States. And so understanding what it means um, a fisherman gets hung down or if they broke down or if they need a tow home without having to, to get too many details and just sort of understanding that is um, a really good way to, to communicate with them and see how that they're feeling and understanding what some of those major stressors are. You want to go to the next slide? And along with some of that is just sort of knowing some of the, the nomenclature also sort of just gives you an idea into how and what they're doing during their day. So um, commercial fishermen are considered industrial athletes. So that is an occupation that requires an, uh, an element of physical activity in order to be able to, to do it. Um, as you can see, obviously from that picture, that guy's got some guns hauling those traps. They can get pretty heavy, especially when there's a ton of lobsters in them. Um, and one of the things that we think about too, and how to communicate about physical health and wellness with commercial fishermen is it's, it's somewhat like the military. That's actually a picture of my brother when he was retiring from the Marine Corps. Um, living with sleep deprivation, living with risk, um, time spent away from home, the physical demands, these types of things are kind of similar. And it's really important to understand what those problems or issues might be in order to find appropriate solutions. So I worked on, on a podcast with some colleagues called Fishing Forward and make sure that you guys get the link to that. And um, in that podcast, when we were talking about sleep deprivation for fishermen, the solution can't be, well, just sleep more or get eight hours of sleep. If that was the case, they would likely already be doing it. But identifying solutions like talking about naps and appropriate caffeine use is a better way to connect with them and allow them to continue to fish. Because much like a lot of soldiers in the military, 
just not working or taking a break isn't always an option. Just not fishing is not a solution for fishermen because fishing, while it sometimes is the major cause of their stressor, of their stress, it's often also their number one coping mechanism and getting back on the water is just exactly um, what they need to feel better. Um, and the next slide. Uh, this is my son, Riley. He's 13 now. So this was a, a number of years ago, but um, I think I, I love this image and I, I think Jenna likes it too. It's just really encapsula encapsulates um, being a fishing family. I think a lot of fishing families have pictures of their kids passed out on the boat in some way, shape or form. Um, it really is, fishing is so integrally tied to our identity. It's what we do as a family. It's a huge part of our community. Um, and it's just why this is all so important for us is to have these types of partnerships, um, to be able to communicate uh, clearly with fishermen and, and help them and be well. So I think now I'm giving it back to Jenna DeShore more about how we collaborate on some of this work. Awesome. Thanks, Monique. It's always fun to listen to Monique share her stories and things. Um, so what did we do um, after roughly a year of chatting about the needs, messaging, what should that look like? Um, healthcare, we hosted an adult mental health first aid training that didn't generate the interest in the fishing families that we had hoped. Uh, so we continued to think about how we could support the existing mental health needs um, and the system in order to be more responsive to fishermen seeking help. We connected with an internal partner in the Midco system, Oasis Free Clinic. The clinic not only serves members of the fishing community, but they had uh, newly hired a clinical medical health provider, uh, which we thought would be great um, resource to support this um, idea that we had. In addition, with our grant funds, we contracted with CCSME, who coordinates and develops clinical trainings in order to assist us with the fruition of our, our idea. And... Um, to take care of some of the training details. In the end, we sponsored a four part training series and you can see the four sessions here on the screen. This partnership was key and it really produced a well-received training um, series for mental health uh, providers statewide that increased understanding of culture, provided resources and looked at overall system impact um, to this, to this in industry. So in general, our big picture feedback, um, as you can see here, the training participants are 97% attended because of interest. This is one of the best pieces of feedback as it really highlights to us the demand for similar content and the desire for relevant professional growth opportunities. There was an overall increase in knowledge of industry specific um, challenges that affect either the mental or physical health of commercial fishermen that they may be working with or hope to work with. Also increased knowledge and confidence to access resources that can support the work of the providers who are caring for fishermen and their families. But the highlight of having um, this was a presenter, Miss Monique, that our community liaison that we worked with um, that not only represents MCFA, but also as she mentioned, is part of a fishing family. And this was incredibly valuable and key as um, her knowledge is abundant and it was very well received by participants. So partnership leads to success. Um, the slide highlights the successful partnerships. It looks confusing, but it's actually, and new partnerships really that have evolved since our first initial meeting with the executive director of MCA, um, um, Maine Coast Fishermen's at the coffee shop in Brunswick. So following our training series, we've continued to meet and explore ways to further collaborate, to continue to support fishermen wellness locally, um, statewide and perhaps even nationally, we have ideas. So we are in the initial stages of collaborating um, with the University of New England as well to support student learning around the commercial fishing industry as it relates to the environment, um, health and wellness. So ultimately, sometimes the work of a public health professional, I often say, is being a connector, um, and which in the end really is highlighted in this particular collaboration and on this slide. So in summary, we'd like to reiterate um, for you to think outside the box and look for non-traditional partners. To use community liaisons, they can be key to your work and your success. Um, take the time to know and understand the perspectives of those you wish to work with. 
Uh, systems policies and, and the environment are significant factors for this community and their overall well-being. Cultural competence is key to success for helping to achieve better outcomes and to support mental, mental health. And collaboration is really critical and can lead to great success. Um, as I've said a couple of times, I felt we felt really proud of what we accomplished and um, our partnership. So I now have an opportunity. I don't. I think we're doing questions now. If there's time, um, if not, we can save some till the end. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was great. No, oh, thank you. Thank you both. This was uh, such a. Um, Interesting session. Uh, you're right, Monique, it is a different topic than uh, we often hear about at this conference, and that was fantastic. I loved the photo of your son that just completely warmed my heart. That was so nice to see that. So cute. Um, so uh, everyone who's listening in, uh, please feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A. Um, there is one question that's come in and uh, it says the same thing I just said to you, which is, this is great. Uh, and the question is, what's up next uh, for your partnership? What else do you have kind of on the, the horizon? Jenna, do you want me to answer that or? I think Monique, that would be great for you to answer. I think you have some. Thanks. And I, I think honestly, this is a non-committal answer, but the sky is the limit. Um, I think we have some writing that we want to do in regards to getting sort of our process and how we went about some of this out into the world. And I'm uh, especially excited about some of the work that we're going to be doing with the University of New England to sort of pilot this on um, a larger scale. And then also, um, you know, working on some more mental health first aid training, not just for uh, for fishermen themselves and their families, but, you know, working with the Department of Marine Resources and others to really continue to move the importance of um, physical health, mental health uh, for commercial fishermen out into the world. Um, MCFA also has a project that we're working on with Northeast Center to um, do a directed outreach campaign to commercial fishermen about mental health awareness with um, an organization called Man Therapy that we met through NAMI Maine, um, who's an, another great partner. And so I, I'm really excited. Um, this is going to sound sort of silly, but, you know, mental health in the commercial fishing industry is still somewhat novel. It shouldn't be at all. But as a group of traditionally, you know, mostly men, uh, it's not super common um, to have this type of awareness. And as I mentioned, where the National Marine Fisheries Service does not necessarily put fishermen um, as a central role in this process, it's just not advocated for the same way that it has been in the agriculture industry. So um, again, I'm really excited about this partnership and, and being able to talk with all of you to just sort of help elevate that message that it's definitely something um, that is needed, especially right now for Maine's lobstermen. I guess so I don't you know, want to add to that, Jenna. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say, like, um, because we know that our coast spans a long distance, but um, we have a specific population here within our communities, friends of mine, people I know. Um, just down the road. And so I think ultimately, I would encourage all of you to. Um, find partnerships in your local communities. Um, we hope to continue to support Monique and the mission of um, MCFA in the work that we're in the work that we're doing here. So yeah, I um Monique, I I, I relate uh, to the characterization that this is um cultural, you know, it's not just a, a type of work. My husband is a carpenter and it's the same uh type of thing. You know, everything is about work, but then the way that they talk about their own health also can be seen in that. So I really related to that. And I think that's a really important point as we think about working with different um populations and, and different sectors and different parts of the of the workforce. Uh so there is another there's another comment here, um, just expressing appreciation. Uh, very grateful for this presentation. And this population is so vital to who we are as Mainers and even the ones who live inland. So um, this was just, it was a very educational uh, presentation. And I wanna thank you both for the work that you've done on this um, and for taking the time to share share this work with us. Um, so I don't, you, we have about 30 seconds left. Do you have any final thoughts, Jenna or Monique, that you want to share before we transition? 
No, I mean, people are welcome to email me whether they want to talk about fishermen and mental health or if they just have like burning commercial fishing questions. Like I said, it's a pretty complex industry. So if you, you read an article or you have a question even about seafood, I've been doing this for a very long time. Happy to chat. Same. I would just say happy to chat or to continue to like reach out to those non-traditional partners. This was, she's one of our, our best. So that's awesome. Thanks. Thank Jenna. you so much for letting us share. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, well, thank you both so much again. Um, this was wonderful. And I want to thank everybody who joined us for this session. Um, we hope you enjoyed it as well. Please remember to complete the session evaluation. I'm going to keep plugging it. Our next session is injury, substance use, and health among fisheries harvesters in Down East Maine. And we'll begin that in just a moment as we transition speakers. So thanks again for joining us and we'll see you shortly. Good afternoon and welcome back after that brief stretch break to our next session, Injury, Substance Use and Health Among Fisheries Harvesters in Down East Maine. My name is Becca Bolas and I'll be moderating today's session. A couple of reminders before I introduce our speakers. The first is that we are offering conference captioning services. Within each session, you'll automatically be provided with captioning, which will appear beneath the video stream. You can click the link to access it in a separate window if you prefer. And if you don't need the service, you can push the pause stop button to stop the stream. The second reminder is to please be sure to complete the session evaluation. It's just four short questions and your feedback is very helpful to us. The link is in the session description and I'll be putting it in the chat momentarily. And with that, I am excited to now introduce our next session speakers, Tora Johnson from University of Maine at Machias. Joseph Spiller from University of Southern Maine and Gray Jones from the University of Maine. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for watching. I'm glad you could be here. So I'm Dr. Tora Johnson uh, and I'm at the University of Maine at Machias and I'm part of the leadership team for the Down East Health Research Collaborative and we'll fill you in about that in a moment. Um, and uh, Joseph and Gray are uh, both students on uh, on the project that we're uh, about to discuss. Uh, first of all, we have nothing to disclose with regard to commercial relationships. So uh, I just want to briefly outline what Down East Health Research Collaborative, Collaborative or DHRC is. We're based in Machias at uh, the, the Machias campus of the University of Maine, uh, and but we have partners from all over the state, uh, faculty from several of the UMaine system universities, as well as independent researchers as partners, as, as well as 
partners, as you'll as you'll see going forward um, in this uh, uh, discussion, uh, partners from lots and lots of different social service organizations uh, and government agencies and on and on. And our goal overall is um, building capacity for community engaged research that is uh, focusing on health and well being in rural places and focused on system change that uh, goes deeper and broader through more cross-sector collaboration and, uh, and applying multiple disciplinary lenses um, towards the complex problems that, that rural people face uh, with regard to health and well-being. So the research team on this study uh, is a cast of thousands, as you can see. Two of our students are shown here in this photo, um, drumming up interest in our survey. Uh, and um, several of, this, of the folks uh, involved are, are student research fellows. We also have partnered with uh, some, some really uh, important uh, partners, including the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, Community Caring Collaborative, Maine Mobile Health, and uh, Lobster and Shellfish Associations, Fisheries Associations, and, and including um, um, MCFA and uh, Maine Lobstermen's Association, who helped us get the word out and, and um, make sure that we were uh, targeting our work appropriately. Oh, I wanna say one more thing regarding our team. Um, and that is that um, cultural competency among the group was really critical. So uh, many of the students and some of the researchers have longstanding experience uh, with fisheries and, um, and as well as folks who have clinical experience uh, and experience providing uh, health and well-being services in a lot of different uh, uh, ways. So it was a really diverse group. I also want to acknowledge our funders, including the University of Maine System Rural Health and Wellbeing Injury Prevention Seed Grant Program, um, Maine Shellfish Restoration and Resilience Fund, and the Elmina B. Sewell Foundation. So getting to the study, uh, we want to point out uh, some key elements of background. So several researchers doing fisheries uh, policy work in the Downeast region have again and again um, come upon health and substance use, as well as some other social determinants of health um, issues arising among fisheries, uh, among fisheries workers and specifically harvesters uh, in our studies. They were uh, clearly impacting the resilience of the communities that we were working with clearly impacting the commercial viability of, um, of the uh, fishing enterprises, as well as the, um, you know, the, the industry as a whole. And so, um, and ultimately we recognize that virtually no one was looking at these issues uh, in any holistic way. And all of the existing studies that, um, that are listed here and uh, have been done on these questions have been done outside of our region. In fact, we spoke with um, some folks doing occupational health with fisheries in Southern Maine and Massachusetts. And we said, you know, we got a lot going on and a lot of fishermen and a lot of fisheries dependent um, communities down East, why don't you come here? And the answer was, it's too far. So all of a sudden we're public health researchers, right? So that's sort of how we began um, that and we've been bringing in expertise uh, to help us with that, um, with that effort. So we know some things um, about fisheries. We know that, that harvesting shellfish, harvesting lobsters um, presents a high risk of injury. We know that chronic pain, um, often typically stemming from injury, is a known driver of opioid use and misuse. We know that work-related injuries precede most opioid deaths. Uh, and we know that workers in fisheries are dis disproportionately at risk um, for opioid deaths and that most uh, harvesters are self-employed uh, are self -employed and are therefore either uninsured or underinsured unless they have members of their family who have, um, who have uh, you know, can provide insurance through their own employer. And now I'll pass it off to Joseph. Um, so for the big scope of this study, uh, our long term, we wanted to implement interventions. Uh, we need to have a better understanding of how widespread this is, what the picture actually looks like within this community. Um, 
what the risks are, the structural factors for injury, pain, management, substance use, as well as the cultural aspects that come into this for the shellfish harvesters. Um, so in the study, uh, we had like our three main kind of points here to understand harvesters risk factors, injury, pain, substance use, um, to identify the barriers that they're facing to positive health outcomes, and to identify what could be done. So on the next slide here, um, as Dr. Johnson pointed out, uh, we have this large team that also comes from a lot of different disciplines. So psychology, GIS, uh, sociology, nursing. So we wanted to take the whole bag that we could find of different methods to put together so we could provide a more complete picture or as complete as we could with this. So we had literature review, we collaborated with our community partners on the survey and design to make sure that we were asking the right questions, that we were looking at the right things. Uh, we went out into the field, uh, such as the picture you saw earlier of Amy and Lauren, where we were not only getting awareness of this, the study going, but also getting a few more insights so that we could continue to move forward. Um, we had surveys of harvesters, healthcare providers, and advocates. Uh, we also then took what we found out in those and started doing semi-structured interviews with the harvesters um, and then separate ones with healthcare providers and advocates. And then we took all of that and did some iterative, iterative coding on the next little slide here. Um, the harvester survey to give you a little more idea of what we're asking, what was going on there. Um, we did this in Washington, Hancock counties. Um, there was a $10 incentive to do the survey for the people who did it. Um, and what we were looking at when we were recruiting, we were sending out invites as well as posting in near the fisheries, uh, shellfish license holders, which we direct mailed, uh, lobster owner operators. Um, and as well as with the outreach posters and stuff, we had some newspaper coverage, waterproof cards that we were passing out. Um, and most of the questions in that, other than demographics, were about injury, health, and healthcare access. Um, we did do a separate one for the providers, and uh, but we're not really going to talk about that today. We're going to focus mostly on the direct harvesters. So on the next slide here. Um, just a little idea of where we're going with that. Uh, healthcare providers, we we're looking at licensed doctors, chiropractors, PAs, FPMs, uh, physical therapists, um, local clinics uh, that we find on the internet sites, people that were in the area. Um, we also asked them what they were seeing on their side from the, a lot of the same questions that we were asking the harvesters. And then we use that to kind of triangulate and hone in everything for when we went to the interviews. All right, so uh, looking a little bit at our preliminary results, you see here we had a total of 83 uh, respondents. Um, if you look at the counts, that adds up to more than 83 because there is a fair, no a fair amount of overlap um, between people working in different fisheries. And go on to the next one. So one of the questions we were really keen to ask, of course, is what kind of injuries have you had while doing fisheries work in the past year? Um, so this question we narrowed to the scope just to ask about the past year and considering that many of these injuries have implications lasting years or lifelong implications, these numbers should be quite alarming. Uh, we also wanted to highlight the disparity between lobster harvesters and shellfish harvesters here, we're mostly clamors. Um, we see that the shellfish harvesters are experiencing significantly higher rates of injuries, and um, there's not a lot of people looking into that. So, next slide. Uh, for, so after doing the surveys in our interviews, um, a lot of the discussion that came up about injury was unsurprising. Uh, but some was surprising, but probably shouldn't have been. <laughs> the severity of wind and sun damage and frostbite that people were experiencing was a bit surprising. Uh, back injury was particularly common among harvesters working in all fisheries. And uh, mental health challenges seemed recursive in a lot of ways. Um, so this might stem from the fact that 
um, shellfish harvesting in particular is a very easy industry to enter for people already experiencing mental health challenges. And combine that with the high injury rates, which often lead to additional mental health challenges, particularly depression and substance use disorders. Next slide. Here's a quote from one of our interviews. I have had frostbite severe enough that now it is self-induced neuropathy. My feet are numb now. I get burning sensation, shoots up into my legs. Next slide. So <clears throat> we asked uh, the harvester respondents what they did in, in response to injuries that they had uh, had uh, uh, that they had received during uh, 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 work at, in harvesting. And uh, it was in, instructive and useful to understand that um, that uh, visiting a doctor, physician's assistant, or a nurse practitioner was pretty far down the list. Um, so only uh, under a third of our respondents uh, referred to that. Um, Self medication and rest, of course, were were the uh, sort of top, um, and followed by exercise and stretching. And we'll we'll delve a little more deeply into those questions in a moment. Uh, this quote is in, is uh, emblematic of what we heard, um, and anybody who's worked with or is married to a fisherman, as I am, uh, is not going to be surprised at all, um, unless it's sticking out or very very bloody. We work through it, uh, and that. Uh, really sums up a lot of the uh, the uh, quotes and discussions and narratives that we heard from harvesters. Where you kind of saw on the last slide that if you notice about only about a third mentioned going directly to a doctor, uh, they had to treat themselves in other ways. So what we found is about a third were using some sort of self-medication here, uh, be it Tylenol over the counter stuff or marijuana CBD. Uh, it should be noted that we did not ask specifically about uh, alcohol use or illicit drugs. Um, we can go to the next slide for that one. Because we really wanted to underscore, we had many anecdotes of addiction and overdose stemming from injury. Um, if you're not going to the doctor, finding a way to keep going to work because you can't really stop working when it's the season, you have to get going. So we heard this in so many interviews. But the data doesn't really align with that because we weren't actually able to get to a lot of people who are actively using. Um, so the type of stuff that we heard about that they were using, uh, oxy, alcohol, marijuana, heroin, meth, uh, kratom, and uh, copious amounts of caffeine, uh, which all go to the comorbidities of hepatitis C, HIV, which leads can also lead to organ failure. And we have a little quote here. Um, a lot of it was due to the injuries, being on the pain medications, and I got addicted to it. And it took off from there. It started with my back, and it just escalated, which kind of speaks to how it starts and the cycle that one can get in trying to keep working and to keep going. So this question, have you ever avoided going to the doctor or getting other kinds of medical care is delving a little bit deeper into the issue of deferral of care. Um, one thing, well, we wanted to point out, you know, affordability was the biggest factor and time the second biggest. And they kind of go hand in hand because a lot of the issue with time is not being able to stop working. Um, but uh, one thing we definitely wanted to point out is this second line here, worried about how I would be treated, is not unfounded. Our provider interviews showed diverse understandings of harvesters' perspectives and pressures. Some were very understanding of the complex pressures and challenges harvesters face, and others exhibited major challenges with cultural competency um, and spoke even with derision and anger. Next slide. Um, so in our further insights from our uh, interviews in, on deferral of care, um, we saw a lot of generational variation in self-care, especially. Um, the younger harvesters seem to um, not have quite a mind for self-care so much as the older generation who would talk about, you know, learning from experience, learning the hard way how they have to take care of themselves. 
Um, uh, we also saw a lot of poor financial literacy among the younger harvesters. Um, and that really has to do with sort of the, the boom and bust cycles when it comes to, to seasonal work like that. Uh, we saw some geographic differences in community openness and support, willingness to intervene and, and help others as well. Next slide. So we saw um, some barriers um, definitely come up in the interviews as well. Um, a lot of people spoke to the, the travel burden, not just um, for receiving health care, but also uh, spoke a lot to traveling um, for selling their catch, um, looking around for the best price that they could get and traveling hours sometimes to a, um, to a dealer. Um, and that added a lot of stress on their bodies as well. It spoke to injuries, not just from the actual harvesting, but then injuries related to the hours and hours and hours of driving spent afterwards. Uh, scheduling care around the tides was particularly challenging and the majority of the people we spoke with were uninsured or underinsured. Next slide. This is one of our uh, quote from one of our interviews. Um, a harvester speaking about a fellow harvester. When he hurt his back, he had no insurance in and out of the emergency room. And he saw a doctor a couple times, had a herniated disc and never received no PT, no surgery, nothing. And so five years later, he was divorced and broken. We wanted to put a few more quotes in there to kind of speak to that. Um, this one, I've actually stitched myself up before, believe it or not. Gruesome. And we have another one here. I think a lot of fishermen would actually get insurance if it was something affordable for them and their family. And uh, one thing we did want to mention is within our interviews, we, we heard a lot of talk about harvesters sometimes knowing that insurance is something that they need at some point but not seeing the immediate need for it and the financial viability of it versus what it costs for the insurance, plus how often they expect to be injured or if they really need it. Um, and this kind of speaks to that. So in conclusion, <clears throat> we found that injury combined with, with structural and normative barriers to care are likely a, con a significant contributor to addiction and overdose among harvesters. I also want to emphasize that we have definitely underestimated and undersampled <clears throat> uh, the most marginalized members of the community. So the survey was electronic um, and, and uh, you needed a certain level of literacy and access to technology and you know the leisure of time uh, to answer the survey. Um, our sample skewed probably older than, than uh, the fishery as a whole. And, uh, and so it's likely that we're underestimating some of these phenomena. We have um, identified some sort of emerging potential solutions and the next step in our work is going to start to explore some of these. Um, but many of these are came right out of our discussions with harvesters. So injury prevention programs, which is really at the top of virtually everyone's list, as well as insurance programs for harvesters could be important. But some new insights um, suggest that financial literacy could have, uh, you know, impacting financial literacy for harvesters could have a significant impact over the long term on their health. Also providing mobile health units and other ways of getting to harvesters with um, screening and, uh, and urgent care, um, as well as working with clinicians on clinical in, on inter, intervening in the cycle of um, injury, chronic pain, substance use, and addiction um, could be really important. And then uh, helping clinical providers achieve cultural competency, as we heard in the, in the prior uh, talk, uh, looks like it could be a really important element to encouraging folks not to defer care. And so the next steps in our work include, um, we're finalizing our, we, we've actually, we're done with data collection, but we're still wrapping up the coding. 
We're uh, currently in a, in a phase also of member checking, meeting with our partners and, and reaching out to um, stakeholders about uh, preliminary recommendations and findings and getting their feedback. And then we're seeking funding for further research um, so that we can understand prevalence, which this study was not, you know, sort of pinpoint prevalence of each of these challenges and uh, uh, which was beyond the scope of this study and also begin to pilot some of the interventions that we have identified. Here's our citations. And uh, I'm happy to, we're happy to hear any questions. Great, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, this worked out amazing to have these two talks uh, submitted and lined right up like this. These were really uh, synergistic. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. I just want to remind folks that if you do have any questions to please uh, use the Q&A feature. Um, the first question is, was whether um, you asked about tobacco use, including e-cigarettes? Um, we did not, I don't believe, and actually Gray is the expert here on every detail of the survey. Um, I don't believe we did ask about tobacco use um, per se. It, um, we were more interested in self-medication for injury and chronic pain. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I will say that we were, I think staggered is not too big a word at the, at the diversity and the extremity of self-medication. I, I think we really don't understand the role that self-medication is having in the, in this population. Um, and, you know, I think we, it, it's worth remembering that there are certain organ involvements that can happen with long-term self-medication. Anyway, um, so we, we didn't directly ask about that, but there's a, there's a lot of substances, um, you know, that are, that are being employed in the fisheries. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see here, the next question, and you, this, you, you were finishing around this, and I don't know um, if you have anything you want to add to it or elaborate on what you were already sharing, but the question is, do you have any policy or programming recommendations? And you did have some, you know, the mobile health clinic and insurance, you had a couple of um, items there, but I, do you want to add anything to that, or, or do you feel like you've, yeah. you've answered that question? Yeah, there are a couple of, of fisheries policy uh, recommendations that are emerging. And, you know, we, we were sort of choosing our audience, but one that really important thing that arose is that access to working waterfront um, is, a, is a significant threat to health. And I don't think that's been recognized before. You know, we've been concerned about access to, to flats and access to boats and that sort of thing. But one of the one of the threads, one of the themes that we've heard in many of these stories was, um, you know, I I'm fishing on a mud flat that's a mile over there, but I can only access the shore over here. And we heard about people being um, injured, people dying, um, and people uh, nearly dying um, because they were using. Um, uh, you know, rickety boats to get to the mud flat or trudging across literal miles of mud flat, um, you know, carrying weights. So, um, so access to um, harvesting locations is really cri critical and maintaining um, working waterfront infrastructure to avoid injury, right? So to keep those those ladders from breaking and keep those, you know, those uh, ramps from being slippery and so forth is actually a really critical element. And we heard many, especially among shellfish harvesters, which is a, a, probably one of the least looked at harvesting, you know, uh, uh, careers uh, and, uh, and is a really crucial sort of backstop economically in the, in the region. So there's some policy implications there and there are others, but that's a, that's a big one. Yeah, um, I mean, certainly, and I also think it seems like there could be an opportunity for um, additional healthcare provider training and and working with, um, you know, whether uh, the different types of healthcare providers, but also some awareness about what you found in your data and then opportunities for them when they're when when people do go visit them. I understand the barriers in terms of insurance and cost and time, but for those that that do go, um, some additional training for them. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I think, um, 
it, it was really stark, the differences between the, the clinical providers who had really put the time and effort and thought into um, providing culturally competent care and versus those who weren't. Um, and, you know, one of the things that really struck me was it was clear in looking at the interviews with providers who were really ang like genuinely angry and hostile about, you know, they don't do anything I say and they're, 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 you know, um, they're judgmental about the way they're um, conducting their healthcare. Um, it was clear that they themselves would be happier if they had ways, better ways to engage with their patients, right? They themselves would, would be more effective and more satisfied with their work if, if we helped to build some bridges. Um, Downey's Health Research Collaborative is also one of our other pilot initiatives is looking at the role of community health workers um, and how we can, you know, uh, train them and, uh, you know, create opportunities in the, in, uh, in healthcare for more diverse people. And so there's a role here that I think, um, you know, health navigation and uh, translation, all of that stuff through culturally competent uh, folks in fisheries um, who can help healthcare providers make connections with their patients. And so that's something that's come up in our conversations as well. I think that final point is so important. I mean, we've talked about community health workers in a few different sessions over the past few days and the value that they have in our um, in, in promoting public health, especially in rural areas among um, immigrant and, and refugee populations and serving in that liaison navigation uh, support role is just so important. Um, so yeah, thank you for ending on that. We're at time. So thank you for ending on that, that point, uh, Tora. And thank you to all three of you for your work on this and for your, your presentation. Um, this was a great, a great back-to-back -back session. I really enjoyed this past uh, hour or so. Um, so I just want to thank everybody who joined us uh, and learned about what for me was a new industry. Um, and uh, just a reminder to please complete the session evaluation. We're going to take about a 10 minute break as we transition to our next and final session, which is arguments for and against universal healthcare in Maine. So I hope to see you back here around 2.50 and thank you all again.